Hey all, welcome to the Slayer Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Ayer, owner of Slayer Duck Calls, a company founded on family heritage, unrivaled quality craftsmanship, and an uncontrollable obsession for hunting. Let's get to it. All right, we're here with the Slayer Podcast. Today we have Ron with the Hunting Dog Podcast on. How you doing, Ron? Not bad. How are you, Bill? I'm doing great. Just uh, been doing a lot of hunting this last couple months and season's got a couple weeks left. So I'm going to try to get in as much as I can before it comes to the end. So how about you? What have you been up to? Well, I've been, I've been contemplating hiring somebody to cut firewood for me, basically. It's just that time of year in Michigan, nothing's open. And uh, I, I mean, I think we've got a late goose season coming here, but I'm also to the point where I'm not going to lay out in a blizzard for a goose, but I love, I love early goose season, but so unless I, I got one trip coming to Braze Island in, uh, in February to go down to a plantation down there just to kind of experience it. And I've got, I've got an invite to go to Arizona on the third of February and I just don't know if I want to get in an airport, get in the plane, get in all that. I mean, I haven't hunted Arizona. And it's one of the few states I haven't stepped my feet in with a gun. Um, I've got a good friend that's making me a great offer. But I could almost say the season's wrapped up. And it's just, for me, it's keeping the wood stove stocked in the kennel and in the house right now. Got it. Well, good. It sounds like uh, you got some some decisions to make. Usually when it comes to hunting, for me, I always lean on, well, I'm going to go hunting. <laughs> yeah, it just depends on the warden. You know, my, uh, my, my warden's been my warden for 38 years, and I thought I'd get more control of the prison as I got older. Yeah. And it turns out that, you know, you got to be one of those inmates that has impeccable behavior to be given more rights. And uh, <laughs> apparently it's, you know, I'm, 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 still, uh, I'm still at the beck and call of the warden. There you go. Okay, well, why don't you tell uh, tell the audience of who you are, who Ron is, the hunting podcast, and you know maybe how you got into hunting and how long you've been hunting for and all that good stuff. Sure, sure. Um, so I started out, believe it or not. Uh, I mean, a lot of my listeners know it just from hearing me a few times, but I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, and uh, if it wasn't for a family who a friend from school whose dad took me trap shooting when I was about 15 years old, 14 or 15, I probably would have been on a bowling league, to be honest with you, Bill. Um, Didn't come up with a gun culture. Uh, My dad worked for the county. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Didn't have any family that hunted. But I, you know, I I think you and I are similar in age, at least. You got enough gray whiskers in your beard. I know you, I know you weren't born in in the seventies. (laughs) <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I was one of those kids that watched American sportsmen and went to the barber shop and saw the magazines and the pheasants and the deer heads on the wall. And I just kind of always hit, even though I was a city rat, we were always flipping over rocks and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a real common story. I mean, whether you lived in the country or the city and, uh, I, I was always trying to keep a snake or a bird from a nest and. I was always interested in nature. And then when I learned to shoot a shotgun, it just kind of like my mind started to wander. And uh, so I was lucky enough to go hunting with, uh, through that friend, met another friend whose dad hunted, took us with him hunting in Illinois, uh, pheasant and rabbit. And uh, and that was probably back in, I think I got my first hunting license in 72, I think it was. And, um, so I started out doing that, and then I kind of recruited the between the friend that got me into shooting with his dad, and then the other friend whose dad took us, our school friends kind of became, like, we actually started our own little trap, cl- not trap club, but we went to a, uh, it was called Downer Girl, Downers Grove Sportsman's Club, and we actually would go there every Friday night, and we shot on a league. Now, we weren't very good. You're, you're thinking, you know, five kids about 18 years old. That's but, awesome, but we started meeting all those guys that had been going there. Right. So it was like meeting 20, 30 mentors. And then, you know, when you're the few young people in a crowd and you're, and you're putting yourself out there with the older guys, you know, they, they kind of take you under their wing and stuff. And 
I'm sure you've been to a few ski clubs or trap clubs. You know, nowadays it's mostly sporting clays and somebody's always got a dog there and somebody's the mag. So it was like this, it just kind of slowly built up. And yeah. uh, I, I just, I had to have a dog and I, I had several failed attempts at dogs, you know, living, living in Illinois. And uh, luckily I, I moved out to Michigan for a work opportunity and I was, I've been in construction my whole life and I moved to Michigan and I always wanted to go to Michigan. Everybody from Illinois wants to either go to Wisconsin or Michigan. I don't know what that says about Illinois, but I'm telling you weekends, you went to Wisconsin. If you had a long weekend, you went around the lake and you went to Michigan and uh, ended up meeting a couple bird hunters here on a job site and uh, you know, just started networking. And uh, it was, it was just an odd path. Um, we, Started, you know, I started getting Gun Dog Magazine like so many people did back in the day, and you know, and uh, Upland Almanac, and starting to read about going out west to hunt. And well, I needed a dog. I needed a good dog. So I had several failed attempts. I had a German short hair that never pointed anything. Um, <laughs> I had a Gordon Setter that I swear was deaf. Um, as far you know, we didn't have a. I didn't take it to the vet for a hearing test. But I did find somebody who wanted the dog. And I thought, you know, that was my, you know, I, it was a, I went up to the UP on a family vacation. I came home with a Gordon Setter pup. And I was like, oh, this is harder than it looks. And finally, I just got my first good German short hair from a well-known, a well-known breeder in, um, in Rockford, Michigan. And then it was like, okay, now I'm on like 30 years old. And now I'm like, it, it took really the first 15 years to get something good yeah and i've got this good dog and then i really it's just a, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy um you 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 meet more people from that breeder there's a guy that lives close by me with a, a, a obviously as a brother to the dog we started hanging out i started doing more grouse hunting um you know still getting lost in the woods I, i'm kind of used to the prairies and you know, the woods threw me off for quite a bit. Um, and then we're very lucky, you know, kind of tying this a little, of course, to Slayer Duck Calls. This other friend of mine that I met on the job site, he took me out on the Muskegon River Flats on our duck opener every year. And that was, that was just flat. I, I don't even call, it wasn't even hunting. It was just shooting. It was, there was so <laughs> many ducks. There was so many wood ducks out on the Muskegon River Flats. It's about a nine mile flat. And, uh, you know, we'd get out there, you know, two thirty, three in the morning, we, you know, take the boat as far as we could walk farther enough to where we saw flashlights, stop telling us to keep moving, keep moving. And I never, to this day, I'd never heard noise like this in my life. Um, it, it was for an hour on opening morning. It was just sounded like the finale of a fireworks show. Yeah. So, you know, that got me hooked on some duck hunting and, and now I want to get into the versatile dog world, so, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and I had just enough freedom. I was kidding before we hit record that, you know, uh, the decisions on a hunting trip, a lot of times are still made by my wife, if I can go, but I had a little easier situation in my career because I was self-employed and I worked construction and I worked around the country. Yeah. So I got a lot of little one and two day hunting trips literally all over this country. Um, very fortunate, just met more people and met more people. So uh, that's kind of where the, the hunting started and, and blossomed. It blossomed in Michigan. Yeah. And, but then, uh, like you say, you bring up a good point. It never ends because then you, you know, oh. you go for specialized breeds, pointers or labs, then you could do the ones that could do cross both. Right. And it, it never ends. It's as far as you want to take it. And then, you know, yeah. what game you're chasing and, and whatnot. It's, yeah, it's a good thing. It was dogs and guns instead of, you know, drugs, you know, because yeah. I would have been all in, I would have, <laughs> I'd, have been, I'd have been all in whatever you turned me on to. I was like, man, that's fun. You know, yeah, when I said, you know, when I, when you said you're, you know, going to the, the uh, sporting clay or trap range at, on Friday nights, that's probably the best place for you. Right. Mm -hmm. When you're 18 yeah. years old on a Friday night. Yeah. I mean, it was great. You know, we, we'd try to, we'd catch up with people later on, but I mean, as, as an example of like how kind of strange we were for where I lived on our, our senior class trip, most kids went down to, I think it was 
somewhere off of Galveston, Texas, or, uh, or they'd go to Florida, right? It's, you know, it's the big, the big spring break. Yep. Everybody underage figures out where they can get their beer from. And they just, you know, and me and my friends went, we looked in a magazine and we planned to go boar hunting in Tennessee. We went to a place called Carriona Hunting Lodge and hunted boar with, with, uh, with the, a guide and dogs. And uh, yeah, we, yeah, there isn't anything you can't attract me to, at least as long as there's a gun involved with it, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, it, it, you're right. It just, uh, you know, what, now I fell in love with the duck hunting. I've already been in love with the grouse hunting. So I wanted to get a German wire hair pointer because I read that they could do it all, right? I'm like, well, yeah, they can. You know, it's, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly a dog that can do both things well. Um, but if I, I, I'm sure you, you know, in your, in your hunting background, if you're really a waterfowler, you need a lab or a chessy, in my opinion, you know, yeah. um, but boy, we would try, you know, we, we get out early season with this wire hair and he was really good at looking for dead ducks. I mean, they're really good. They almost, I would, I would put them up with the training we did with them with uh, North American versatile hunting dog association. Um, you know, when it comes to looking for a cripple, you're, you're not, you're not hamstrung when it comes to a cold, rainy, nasty day, yeah, that, that wire hair wasn't hacking it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I, 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 I've been addicted. I mean, it's really bad. I, I try different breeds of dogs. Now I, um, <laughs> we, you talked about meeting some Broncos in California and uh, said, yeah, that's my breed of choice. And I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. They're just yeah. different. They look cool. They almost look like a bloodhound, right? And there's something about, I don't know what it is. It attracts me too. I know it's because they're Italian, but. Right. You know, but. Well, for me, it was a little bit of their demeanor. I, I actually helped a guy with a rescue. He went, in fact, he went to Italy on an anniversary trip, saw one walking on a leash and I don't know what city in Italy he was in. And he brought the picture back to me and he didn't send it to me with the phone. He just literally brought me, you know, developed film from his camera. And when I saw him, he says, do you know what kind of dog this is? I got to have one. I'm like, uh, I think so. <laughs> I think, I think I saw that in a magazine. Yeah. And he actually found the breed and he found one that was returned to a breeder and I helped him with it. And I, this dog's disposition was so silly and so goofy and I've had hard charging, high powered, high desire dogs before. And I still did to that time. And I just thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to have something to watch television with, you know? <laughs> and uh, so then I started looking for Broncos. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it was, it's been a strange road. It's been a strange road. It was up to my wife and I, we'd have 25 dogs, just, <laughs> you know, it, but let, tell me a little bit about the hunting dog podcast. So, you know, that was a good recap of, you know, how you got into hunting and how you're still, you know, obsessed with it. But uh, yeah. yeah, tell us about the hunting dog podcast. How'd you get into that? What made you get that going? Well, I, I, I started listening to podcasts pretty early on, um, spending so much time on the road. And uh, so I, I was one of the few, I, I would tell somebody like, hey, you should listen to this podcast. It'd be like History on Fire at that time, or Joe Rogan, or uh, there was, there's a couple of, there was a couple of deer hunting ones out there. There was nothing in the upland world, but bottom line was I I've been lucky enough to make a few episodes of television with Steve Ranella, who oh, yeah. um, most people know, you know, from the meat eater series on Netflix and his yep. podcast. And so he worked for me, uh, you know, after he got out of high school, all through college, after college, part-time, full-time. Um, in fact, his brothers worked for me. And he invited me to come out and do a couple of episodes uh, oh, over about a three-year span. And the last episode we did was actually in 2014. And he didn't have his podcast yet. And he told me after we got done hunting cranes, he said, hey, Ron, and he knows me. I, after the day is done, I start drinking a beer. That's, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful habit. I'm a, I'm a four o'clock <laughs> guy. I, I like to stop at seven o'clock. I don't want to go to bed 
you know, sideways, but boy, especially being in construction, it was the, it was what I did. And he literally come up to me and he says, Hey, Ronnie, he says, in about an hour, we're going to record a podcast. And so don't have too many beers. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I thought, okay. All right. I said, but I can, I said, what are we, where are we doing this? And he said, Oh, we're going to, they're renting a house in Texas for us to stay in, in the film crew. He said, Oh, right. At the kitchen table. Like I thought we were going to a studio or something, right? I, I'd only listened to the ones I've listened to. I didn't realize that this was a portable mobile, literally anybody could do this thing. And we're sitting around the kitchen table with headphones on and his engineers or his, his producers, he just learned how to use this recording device. And we're all sitting there going, test, test, test. Okay. We just did a recap of the hunt and, and the whole time we're doing this, my mind's going, I am doing this about hunting dogs. I am doing this about hunting dogs. Um, I don't know, Bill, do you keep a diary or a, a, a log of your hunting years? Uh, I, you know, I'm pretty poor at it. I try to, and I get started mm-hmm. on it and then I'll take a, you know, it goes away and then it comes back. So it's, it's, yeah. it's one of those deals where it's uh, kind of stitched together. Yeah. And, and I'm the exact same way. And I've got three different books, like once in a while for Christmas, my wife will get me a, I remember one time she got me one from Orvis, you know, and you could fill out, you could fill out the dog's name, the gun, the load you used, sunny day, cloudy day. And I thought, oh, this is going to get me to do it, you know? (laughs) And I think there's probably 10 pages filled out in that thing. So my mind is sitting there on that podcast with Steve about how am I going to do this? And once we hung up the headphones, I said, Steve, I, I said, you, you're, you're obviously in a whole different world than I am. We, you know, we're still very good friends, but I've got to do this. I got to figure out, I need the name, the model of this equipment. I, I got to do this about hunting dogs. And part of my catalyst for it was I, I knew enough about, you know, the internet. Like if I could start recording stories after a hunt with guys, and those are, I don't know how you are, Bill, but if you're a hunter, you've almost got to be the same. The conversations after the hunt, fresh after the hunt, sitting on the tailgate, poking fun at each other, laughing about the dogs, laughing about missing. Yeah. You know, I could never write down in a diary, even if I was good with a, a hunting diary, I don't I could never get that inflection in my writing. Yeah. Um, so immediately my first thought was I'm gonna start recording my stories from hunts and then see if I could make a podcast that that was kind of it was like backwards right I was like we could just record this and then at least my kids will have it or my grandkids someday will have it and uh and then I literally I got home four days before Christmas told my wife I don't know what you got me for Christmas but we got to buy something right after Christmas and uh bought all my recording gear and then literally figured out you know there's websites how to do your own podcast and um It was, I am such a talker, as you can probably tell. It it was just, it was tailor-made for me. Um, If somebody calls me up these days now, I'm in my eighth season of the podcast. This started my, uh, January starts my eighth year of doing the podcast. And uh, I I look forward to doing a podcast and recording a a conversation with somebody just like I look forward to a hunting trip. Yeah. Uh, to me, it, it, it gives me, uh, you know, like 50 hunts a year. It morphed into a whole lot more than just tailgate stories. When I realized I could interview fellas like uh, Ben Williams out in Montana, you know, about his early days out there with his pointers uh, out on the, uh, on the Montana prairies, and then meeting people in the industry and, and getting their stories. And uh, yeah, it was it was kind of, it was totally accidental. Um, and it's turned into basically a, a career for me. That's awesome. So what could people expect when they, you know, they tune into your podcast, obviously it's about dogs, right? Hunting dogs, but what are some of the things to, you know, people would expect to, to hear on that? Well, I would say there, there's something that we're, that I, I've, I'm kind of known for, not known for, um, there's a, a continuing, I, I like getting other trainers on and other breeders. Um, <clears throat> and especially every once in a while, I can get somebody, you know, thanks to Facebook and Instagram, I get somebody from overseas. I've had people from Australia and Germany. 
talking so people could expect to find an episode. I'm, I, I could tell you, I've talked with dog handlers, dog trainers, and hunters in England, uh, Scotland, Germany, Australia. So we kind of compare notes. We compare game laws. Uh, sometimes I do it with a particular breed of dogs, like uh, let's say the, the small Munsterlander. I've done a couple episodes of those um, with a breeder who's, who knows their business, who was like early in the program. And we'll break down that breed. Um, and I'll ask him all the questions, like if I was looking for that breed. So I kind of put myself on the, on the client side of the question. Um, I might know the answer to a lot of questions. You know, when somebody says, well, what are you looking for in a dog? Or, you know, how big are the dog, male, female? I know what I like. But when I interview people like that, I try to give them the questions that, uh, that people, the people are thinking that the listeners are thinking, yeah. you know, w- without being too uh, expert. And, and, I, and I guess, Bill, what I mean by expert in my background in the dog world, um, if, if there's a level of expertise I have, for, for about 25 years, I judged for the North American Versal Hunting Dog uh, Association. And what that means is any pointing dog it doesn't matter what, where it's from. If it's registered here in the States, it's registered with NAVDA. There are hunt tests out there for puppies, intermediate, high level. Um, and on anywhere from six to eight weekends a year, I would fly or drive uh, to different areas around the country. And I'm a, one of three judges that gives your dog an evaluation and a score based on a set of standards. So I would say in the pointing dog world, I'm kind of an expert, especially on, on like breeds and, and what we're looking for in a dog. And again, of course, that's all to a standard that I'm very familiar with. Yep. Um, so like I said, back to when I interview somebody, I don't, I don't want to come off and meet a breeder of small monster landers and explain to them the NAVDA test. I, I want to ask them how they got involved with the dog, how, what history do they know about the dog? I might know more history about them than they do, you know, yeah. but um, so that's something people can expect. Another thing we do a lot, a lot of times is just after a hunt and some of those get a little sideways. Let me tell you, because <laughs> when, when we have nowhere to go and we're at the tailgate or we're camping or we're at a lodge, uh, I'll break out the microphone and everybody's already into their, you know, uh, I don't know what beer number it is. I'll, I'll hold the number of beers back. <laughs> but with, with me, I drink, I drink light beer, but I drink it in copious amounts. Oh yeah. And some of our best downloaded episodes are me and three guys just laughing our asses off. Just, you know, about what happened that day or two days that we, you know, yeah. that we hunted. So the podcast is called the Hunting Dog Podcast. Um, but it goes all over the place. There's always a common thread in there. Um, I, I do a lot of work with Pheasants Forever and Rough Grouse Society. Um, so I'll have those contingents on or those, you know, those people from those groups on. And we'll talk about habitat and forest restoration and grass restoration. But whoever they give me to talk to is also a dog person. So, you know, we, and I'm, I'm also known for probably this is, for being on your podcast, this is probably as long as I've ever been serious in my whole life. Right? <laughs> um, it, it's and it's not about you know, you know, hurting someone's feelings or, or or using language. It's more like just making fun of people and dogs and what we yeah. do. It, it, I think we're almost laughable sometimes if we look at ourselves. Oh, I mean, we sit out there. I can't tell you how many times we sit out in the duck blind and we look at ourselves like, what if, what are we doing right now? We're sitting here. <laughs> blowing a duck call up in the air these ducks we're trying to kill them it's six degrees out it's snowing we got up at three o'clock we've got two hours of sleep what are we doing yeah and sometimes just that giddy laughing kind of takes the pain away doesn't it oh yeah you, you kind of have to laugh at yourself every once in a while um sure. yeah now, i'm gonna put you on the spot here ron so this yeah. is probably a question you get a lot but uh sure. so if you had one upland dog that you had to choose from you're a chucker hunter, pheasant hunter, 
quail hunter, grouse hunter, um, you know, you're hunting thick forests, uh, open plains. What, what would be your go-to breed? Well, I, it, it's a breed that I, I had a lot of experience with and I don't currently own, but I would probably pick the German wire haired pointer. Yeah. And why um, is that? What, what, what are some of their attributes that, that make it that dog for you? Well, one of them is it's, it would be rare. And in, in when I say to get a dud, um, there there's, it's rare to see a real dud dog. Right. But they're, their breeding philosophy from Germany and the breeding philosophies we have in NAVDA and in the, in the German breeding clubs that are still here, you know, there are some of, there are some of those dogs that are still referred to as Deutsch Drahtar. And, and that is, that would be like if you were a member of the German parent club. Um, the breed is pretty, and I mean, pre, I don't, this is at least 51%. It's pretty or very true to type. It's, you know, it's going to have a durable coat. It's going to have a lot of gur. It's going to, it's, it's, it's going to be able to handle the different weather. It's going to be able to handle the snow. It's going to be able to handle the briars. It usually has a real good, a real good water drive for, because the, the Germans, the Germans, what they did in Germany when they developed these tests, you know, before we ever had them here in America, um, the things that they asked those dogs to do and selectively bred for that, it kind of guarantees you to get what you're looking for. Yeah. Now, you can still find that with a lab, a German short hair. You could still find an Irish setter that hunts like an Irish setter did in the 50s. But you got to do some looking, right? Yeah. You, you really got to do some looking um and it, yeah that would be it, and i can tell you i i almost i almost went back a good good friend of mine in north dakota he's always teasing me about having my brocos now you know i love them for their disposition as much as their hunt right i i think their disposition is better than their hunt um i've, I've been very fortunate to have a couple really good ones and a couple mediocre ones and uh he always wanted me to get another wire hair. Well, I did get a wire haired Vigila last year and him and I actually went in, we actually co-owned the dog. And, uh, so I kind of got back into the wire hair, but not the German wire hair. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. And so, you know, there's, you know, I know every hunter that I hunt with, I would say it's probably 80% or above want to have a hunting dog. You know, either they have one, or they're looking to get one at some point in their, their hunting career. Yeah. What, what are some of the mistakes people make, you know, at when choosing a breed and then also choosing, you know, once they find the breed they want, you know, choosing a pup, what are some common mistakes you, you see people making? Well, I would say probably a common mistake is not really being honest about what you're planning on doing with the dog. I mean, what happens with so many people is let's say if you take somebody duck hunting and then it just works out where this person, whether you work with them or he's an in-law and pretty soon he's like, that's what I want. And he, he only saw one snapshot. He saw you and your dog and yeah. he got to shoot some ducks. Right. But when he goes back home and he lives in Indiana, he's not a big duck hunter. Right. Maybe, maybe he, you, you can sometimes fall in love with the breed and not think about what was the breed's specialty. So if you're trying to get a specialty breed, you should kind of make sure that you're going to be able to, you know, if, if you want a lab, I, I think you should be a duck hunter. Now, of course, we know it's the most registered dog in America, right? And probably 3% of the Labradors in this country ever put a duck in their mouth. But, you know, if you buy a lab for hunting, you, you should be putting ducks in its mouth. Yeah. And uh, so I think one of the biggest mistakes is people, they see something and they just, they want it too quick without thinking, what can I really do with this dog? Yeah. Or, you know, like, now you could compete with the dog. Dog's happy. Dog's happy as long as you give them a job. Right. So you could do that with, for, certainly with a lab. Uh, you could do it with any dog. You could, you can go to hunt tests and retriever tests and things like that. So I, I think some people just, they kind of make a snap decision 
another one they'll make is, and I get this a lot. My dad had them when I was little. <laughs> okay. <No>. And <laughs> I'm like, well, did you hunt with it? No, but that was my dad's favorite dog. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, yeah. you know, and we, we kind of forget, it's just like stubbing your toe. We kind of forget how much the pain is. Like, you know, you mentioned about your first lab was, wasn't really well trained. Wasn't that great. Right. Yeah. But, um, one, one I get a lot is, is, you know, my neighbor has a, a, a dog that's papered. It's a hunting dog and, uh, they've got some puppies available and I want to start hunting. I'm like in the back of my mind, I'm like, man, that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Yeah. If, if that would be a fall, I don't know what we would call it. It would be calling it, uh, taking, taking the passive lease resistance, right? Yeah. Um, it happens to be for sale close to me. Therefore I'll be a hunter, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that could get people, that could get people in trouble. The, the funny thing is about the internet now though, there's almost too much information out there now. Um, so People can also do the opposite. They can do too much research. I've had, I've had people write me and say, Ron, we're getting a dog and I've narrowed it down and they've, they've picked a Weimar Weiner, a Griffin, a Bracco, and a Cocker Spaniel. And I'm like, you, you picked four different dogs. How do you want me to help you narrow it down, right? They, they, they read the breed description. You know, there's websites that says what breed's right for me and you plug in your your acreage and the city and your zip code. And it says, these dogs would be good for you. So, uh, you know, I don't know how many people, I don't know. I might be better at telling people how to pick a dog as opposed to what mistakes to avoid. Cause we're all going to make mistakes. Yeah. You know, I think but, you mentioned it and I've made the same thing. It usually takes a couple of dogs before you start figuring it out. It does. You, the, the biggest thing is if, if you can find a mentor, who either is connected in some version of that breed's activity. You, you, you know, you might not get that lucky and have the breed. Let's say you want a Brittany, you know, yeah, there might be a Brittany breeder within an hour from you. And if you make, you go there and make friends with them and tell them you're looking for a dog down the road and you get on his list and you kind of hang around a little, if you could get that mentor, if you can find the breeder that'll work with you, that's usually a recipe for success. But people don't always do that. And, and not every breeder, you know, most breeders have one, two litters a year, unless you're a big operation. And if you're a big operation, you really don't have the time to mentor somebody. And if you're a small operation, you probably got two kids and a full-time job. Yeah. Um, but I've told people, if you can find a breeder of the breed nearby you and establish a relationship with them, that's, that's, that's volumes of good right there. Um, because you can lean on that person for a lot of advice. He's probably going to let you work with the dogs. You're going to get to actually meet the parents for sure. You're going to get to at least meet the, the mom of the dogs, you know, and make sure it's what you want. Um, so yeah, I, I tell people if possible, you know, fall in love with the breeder and you might just fall in love with the breed. Yeah, that's a great point. So my last question, you know, take breeds away, um, you know, take breed away from the, from the question, what do you consider a good hunting companion, hunting dog? What are the, the attributes that you would consider, you know, or some must haves? Well, there's, this is a hard, it may not be hard to explain for some listeners, but it's, 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 it's a trait that's inherited in dogs. And I learned this through our judging program. Okay. And this is in the pointing world. So there's seven inherited traits. And one of those inherited traits is called cooperation. And what that means is that dog absolutely treats you and responds to you in a cooperative. He's not giving you a hard time. He's not, he's not arguing every step of the way with you. Um, he's sometimes even a dog, let's say that naturally retrieves. Now we know you could train them to retrieve better and to hold the bird in your mouth and, you know, make blind retrieves, but a dog that just goes out and gets something and brings it back to you, that shows a level of cooperation as opposed to a dog that goes out and runs around circles and goes off in the corner and eats something. 
Um, a dog that literally, I know it sounds funny, but all puppies come when they call, right? I mean, no one's ever seen a 12 week old puppy that you didn't get down and you go, yeah, pup, 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 pup. Of course they come running to you. How many people have had a dog that's a year, year and a half old that you could scream to your blue in the face. The dog's like, you know, talk to my head. My butt hurts from listening to you. You know, I got a Jack um, Russell I can give you. That's kind of, like <laughs> there you go. Okay. Per, there. Uh, my wife's first two corgis. I mean, zero cooperation unless you gave them a treat and waved it on a string they weren't coming to you they were very independent dogs you can you could get a very independent dog and train it to a high level of 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 obedience to over to override that lack of cooperation but that means it's work every time you go hunting how many people you know have to have a collar on their dog have to always tap them to remind them. I mean, a really cooperative dog, you don't need a collar on your dog. I, I like a collar so I never lose my dog, especially with pointing dogs. You know, they can get into a fix, they can get into a pickle or, you know, chase a deer and, and get out of range. But I mean, a really good hunting dog, you don't need an electric collar to hunt that dog. It could, electric collar can be a great tool, but a really cooperative dog just wants to work for you. And it, and that's a hard thing to see because as dog owners, unless we're, like you said, unless we're on our second or third dog and we're like going, wow, this dog, this dog is easy, right? This dog, this dog was just so much easier to train. So some people used to use the word biddable. Oh, this dog is very biddable. You could teach it everything. But the word I use because of my, my training is the dog is very cooperative. Yeah. You know? And so that's my personal hallmark. I need a dog that's very cooperative. Got it. No, that's a great point. What, what are the other six uh, uh, inherited traits? Well, I mean, people would, would, I'll break it down. Hang on a second. Let me, let me get it right. Let me get it right out of the, uh, right out of the book. Oh. Sorry about that. Maybe, uh, Oh, no, you're okay. It's yeah. funny. We're on a topic I could talk all day about. So I got to watch the time. Uh, we got about yeah. 10 minutes left, but I could sit here and talk to you for, for hours. Right. right, right. Let me just get to the, okay. So the, the traits and I, and I wanted to say them off the way the card is, is the dog's use of nose. So the nose is definitely a genetic trait. Um, on our cards, we say use of nose because we're not challenging that the dog has a good or a bad nose. We're just trying, trying to see how well he used it that day. So the dog's nose, the dog's search, the dog's water, and water being its, its ability to take water as another type of terrain, just simply go in and swim a couple times, and then later on, you know, would do some duck work in the water. The pointing instinct, which is very obviously, that's inherited pointing. The tracking, which when we talked about the German breeds, you know, famous for their tracking. Uh, you talk about not wasting game the way they do in Europe. And then the desire to work. You know, some people say desire or some people say energy, but the inherited trait, we refer to it as desire. And the last one is cooperation. Got it. Very good. Well, Ron, it's been awesome talking with you. Maybe one day we could walk a field and, and uh, shoot some birds behind some good dogs. That'd be awesome. That would be nice. That we, we almost we almost ran into each other. We were we were in the same state for a little bit, weren't we? Yeah, we were. Um, but uh, one day we'll have to do it. You know, we're right here by the Wahis. Great chucker hunting. I don't know how much of that you've done, but uh, if you ever want to make a, a pass through Idaho, or uh, I got buddies in Nevada, you know, big time chucker hunters, we could uh, we could go do that too. Well, Bill, I'll, I'll hold you off till 2023 because 2022 is going to go on a bad knee and then I'm going to get it fixed next winter. So then I'll be able to chase a chucker with you. <laughs> yeah, that's not for the faint of heart. No, or for the old guys like me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, Ron, I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to seeing more episodes or hearing more episodes of the Hunting Dog Podcast. It's been a joy having you on the Slayer Podcast and, uh, We'll just go ahead and leave it there and 
you have a great day. It's about four o'clock, so you should be ready for that beer almost. I am. You know what? I'm going to bump it. It's 10 minutes early. <laughs> there you go. All right, Bill. I appreciate it. Thank you. You bet.